Ryan Illich uh, from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine and welcome to this online module um, in which we'll cover the basics of systematic reviews. So here we have the uh, objectives for this particular module. Uh, the main focus is on understanding the difference between a systematic review and a narrative review, um, understanding the essentials of, I guess, publication bias and other biases associated with systematic reviews. Um, and then finally being able to um, understand how to interpret a, a systematic review, but then more so being able to use that evidence um, in policy making and practice. So the differences between systematic reviews and narrative reviews. So briefly, narrative reviews, um, often called just literature reviews, um, the main difference is they're not very transparent. So from a, a methodological point of view, um, there is no real me uh, method um, with narrative reviews. Um, they're often broad in scope, um, don't have a critical appraisal component to it, um, and basically um, are, are an extended um, opinion piece to a certain extent because the author is using the literature in order to support their view on a particular topic. Um, conversely, systematic reviews um, uh, have a very structured approach and are very transparent, um, particularly from a methodological point of view. So the first thing you'll note is that there is a methodology, <coughs> excuse me, with a systematic review. Much like the uh, evidence-based practice process, um, there should be a specific uh, clinical question uh, using PICO. Um, if it is a um, Cochrane review, um, it will have a protocol published uh, previously uh, prior to um, the publication of the systematic review itself. Um, otherwise, um, it should have these components, including uh, a comprehensive search strategy that if you wanted to, you could replicate. Um, a systematic review will also have, um, generally speaking, um, an appraisal of the studies included in the systematic review. Uh, whether they be randomised control trials, cohort studies or case control. Um, you can have a systematic review of all those types of um, studies, but usually what sets them apart is that there is some type of um, critical um, appraisal component to it. Um, and then if there's a, a, a sufficient data, um, a meta-analysis will also be conducted. So what types of biases can occur in a systematic review? So if we're thinking about a systematic review of um, RCTs or cohort studies or whatever it may be, um, th th there still is the possibility of introducing bias um, from, from a number of areas, whether it be um, the way in which the search um, was conducted, um, whether or not um, just one um, database was used as opposed to a variety, um, whether or not publication bias was an issue. Um, we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and thirdly, um, the way in which the uh, uh, appraisal of studies um, that were included in systematic review were performed. Um, so was it uh, performed using a, um, a validated tool? Um, was there um, clear, transparent um, appraisal of, of each study that was not only included, um, but also reasons given for studies that were uh, excluded from the systematic review. So here we've got um, what we call a funnel plot. Um, so it uh, doesn't look like much of a funnel plot there, um, but the name's taken from, um, if, if you were to take a funnel and invert it, you'd get this shape. Um, and basically what a funnel plot tries to um, identify is whether or not publication bias has occurred. Um, so don't get too up on the um, on the numbers and whatnot, but we'll, we'll keep it fairly basic. So um, along the um, x-axis, just um, view this as a um, as an odds ratio. Obviously, anything along this side um, is beneficial or a positive study. Anything on this side is a negative study. Um, and along the y-axis, we've got standard error. So basically, uh, the larger the trial, the smaller the standard error. The smaller the trial, the larger the standard error. Um, and it takes its, I guess, funnel shape uh, from the fact that um, when you plot all the studies that you've included um, in your systematic review, you should get this type of shape occurring. So um, large trials at the top, 
um, smaller trials down the bottom, um, you'll get smaller trials which produce a really positive result, um, and then you'll get those other smaller trials which may not produce as good a result. Um, if we were to have a funnel plot, and it kind of looked like this, um, it would indicate that potentially publication bias is an issue. The reason why we say that is we're missing these studies that we would see on this side. Um, so th there may be a number of reasons why that may be so. Um, it may be that they haven't been published um, to date um, just because of time reasons, um, or it may be that they haven't been published um, at the request of whoever is sponsoring um, the, the study. Um, needless to say that um, this type of systematic review would identify that publication bias is an issue, um, or it also may, uh, may highlight that the, um, that the search was inadequate. So studies may be out there, but for whatever reason, um, our search isn't picking it up. Um, so for, for, from a number of um, viewpoints, uh, funnel plots are really powerful um, in terms of identifying uh, whether or not publication bias um, is a factor in your systematic review. Okay, I'm just going to spend the next couple of slides just talking about how to interpret a forest plot um, because that's the other thing that I want you guys to be able to get out of this um, module. Um, so uh, forest plots can be performed either on dichotomous data um, in which they'll be uh, represented as a relative risk, relative risk reduction, um, odds ratio, etc, etc. Um, forest plots uh, or meta-analysis can also be done on continuous uh, data um, and there's two types of what we call continuous data weighted mean difference or standardized, standardized mean difference so the mean difference just being the, the, the differences between the means of the two groups um, so just for your information um, weighted mean difference um, is used uh, when the outcomes are measured on the same scale so blood pressure um, standardized mean difference on the other hand is used when we standardize I guess the outcomes because they're conceptually the same uh, but they're measured on different scales so an example might be um, pain or, or depression um, one scale might, might measure it on a scale of 1 to 10 another on a, a scale of uh, 1 to 4 um, so they're still measuring the same thing um, just a, 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 a wider variety um, and so by standardizing that measure um, we're able to um, get much more of a, um, a robust result there so this is what a forest plot looks like, um, and I'll quickly run through it. Um, so this is um, a, uh, a review um, up here um, taken from a Cochrane review. Uh, so it's looking at um, screening for colorectal cancer using the FOBT, um, and it's comparing uh, screening uh, versus control. Um, and our outcome here is colorectal cancer mortality. Um, so Along uh, this side, we've got um, the number of studies that were included in the systematic review, at least for this particular outcome, colorectal cancer mortality. Uh, we've got four. Uh, we've got our intervention group, so screening. We've got a control group. Um, and for each of the studies, so if we take the first study by Funen, um, it will give us um, the particular results. So um, in this case, 362 out of 30,967 participants in the screening group um, had the outcome uh, compared to 431 out of the 30,966 in the control group. Um, and for each of the studies, um, the re results are reported uh, graphically um, here, um, or we can look at it um, numerically. So the odds ratio here for the first study indicates um, an odds ratio of 0.84, uh, confidence interval um, 0.73 to 0.96 um, so the confidence interval doesn't include one so it would suggest um, that there's a statistical difference between screening and control groups in terms of um, colorectal cancer mortality um, and the fact that it's less than one um, means that it favors um, the screening group um, we can like I said also look at that um, graphically um, and so if you sort of zoom in close um, you can see the um, odds ratio with the um, two confidence intervals. One thing to note with systematic reviews, um, and particularly with um, meta-analysis or forest plots, 
um, we don't just simply add up um, the, um, the results from the four studies. Um, so as you'll see here, um, each one of these studies has a different type of blob. Um, so the blobs here um, represent how much each study uh, contributes to the overall uh, meta-analysis. Um, so, as you'd imagine, um, a study like the Nottingham study, which has um, 76,000 participants in both groups, uh, will contribute 42% uh, to the overall um, result. Compare that with the Minnesota study, um, which has 31,000 and 15,000 uh, participants, um, and that only contributes 14%. Uh, so the overall result that we're looking at is this thing here called the pooled estimate of effect, um, represented in this case by a diamond. Um, and again, we can look at it graphically or um, numerically. So looking at it numerically, um, the overall meta-analysis when the results from the four studies are combined um, gives us an odds ratio of 0.84, confidence interval 0.78 to 0.9, indicates a statistically significant difference between the two groups and a benefit. Um, so what this, um, uh, particular uh, meta-analysis is suggesting is that screening with the FOBT reduces the odds of having uh, colorectal more sorry reduces the odds of colorectal mortality uh, by 16%. Similar process here um, with our continuous um, outcomes. Um, so in this case, we're looking at um, glucose therapy for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Um, looking at glucosamine versus NSAIDs, um, and the outcome is pain. So pain being a continuous outcome. Um, the only difference here is that we're looking at mean difference. So rather than one being the line of no effect, um, as makes sense, um, zero um, would be the um, line of no effect here. So if, um, for example, uh, the mean uh, pain score in the control group is one, and the mean score in the um, intervention group is one. One minus one would give you zero, hence why zero um, is our line of no effect. So for any continuous outcomes, um, if the confidence intervals include zero, um, that um, is basically telling us that there's no statistical difference between the two groups. So similar sort of thing, if we look at the final uh, result, um, the standardized mean difference is um, a, a reduction of uh, pain by 0.27 points, um, not a whole lot. Um, and so if you look at the uh, confidence intervals, um, they go from minus 0.65 to 0.11. So they include the zero, so no statistical difference. And that's also um, identified here graphically with the um, uh, overall pooled estimate um, or this particular aspect hitting the line of no effect, which would indicate that there's no difference between the two groups. Um, the, the last thing that I just want to talk about um, is just to keep in the back of your mind what we call statistical heterogeneity. So there's no point pulling studies together if, um, if they differ so far um, apart from one another. We're not really getting a, a true, true pooled estimate. Um, you don't have to concern yourself about how to calculate these uh, numbers, but it's more so about interpreting it. So all those sort of numbers down the bottom in terms of chi-squared and degrees of freedom and p-values and i-squared, um, a general rule of thumb is if you have a, um, a p-value which is less than 0 0.05 in this case, um, it indicates statistical heterogeneity. So that indicates that our studies are significantly different from one another or from one another in their composition. So when we're doing a, a meta-analysis, we want our studies to be homogeneous. So we want them to be similar as possible. So if we identify that heterogeneity is present, um, it basically put, puts a big question mark in terms of whether or not we should be doing a meta-analysis in the first place. Similarly, you can look at the I-squared statistic. So if that's over 50%, general rule of thumb, um, it means that there's um, heterogeneity among the studies, which brings into a question our um, meta-analysis. Uh, 
So in this particular example, um, it's all good. The p-value is above 0 0.05. The I squared is less than 50%. Well, in this case, it's zero. So it's telling us um, that our um, results are valid um, and we can uh, be confident in taking away um, that particular um, result from the meta-analysis. So the last thing I'm just going to highlight is that you can dig a little bit further and do sensitivity analyses as well as subgroup analysis. So they sound very complicated, they're not. Um, a sensitivity analysis is basically doing a meta-analysis um, and then seeing what happens when you remove studies that are um, or, well, studies that you've graded as a poorer quality. Um, so you may, you may have one meta-analysis that includes all studies, um, and then you may rerun that meta-analysis, um, including only the studies that you've um, identified as being a good quality, and seeing if you have any differences between the two. Similarly for subgroup analysis, um, you can do the same. So you can identify or you may, may identify that um, you know, sex may be an issue or you may be looking at, uh, for example, with the um, screening um, example with um, colorectal cancer that you want to see what impact does screening at different ages ma uh, make upon um, uh, cancer mortality. Um, so you may break up um, the, the studies um, according to different subgroups um, and see what impact it has. Uh, that's it for me for this uh, particular video. Hopefully you found that somewhat um, useful and entertaining. Um, as always, feel free to um, uh, drop me a line um, via email if you have any questions. Thank you.